And so what I'm going to do today is we're going to uh, continue in our series called Swipe. And uh, first service, they were the guinea pigs. So I feel like we got a pretty smooth groove now. Uh, but what we're going to do for about 15 or so minutes, uh, we're going to do some Q&A via text messaging. Um, so they should be able to put the phone number on the screen. So today we're going to talk about relationships. There was a bunch of questions that came in. So just a heads up, when they put the text message or the phone number on the screen, we're not going to be able to get to everyone's messages because we want to cater to your time as well. And what we're going to try to do after our recap, uh, we figured out too, we may need to follow up outside of service to answer some of those questions. So we may do something online via social media, uh, but some Q&A. And uh, so what I'm supposed to do is just get the ball rolling. It's going to be an abbreviated sermon. But if you have questions, my wife and I are going to be here. Just a disclaimer, we're not relationship experts. So don't be trying to get free counseling out of us, okay? <laughs> but I will say this, we've had over 11 years, we've known each other for almost 14 years now, and been together for 12 of those 14 years. We've worked together for all 12 of those years, like work together. Like we just got into a fight in staff and we got into a fight at home. So it's compounded. So I feel like we've been married for about 58 years together, but we're just getting started. So all that to say is we're not relationship experts, but compounded being in ministry for 20 plus years not only together, but individually been in ministry for most or over half of our lives. Uh, we've just seen a thing or two. So the main game plan for today is to support you in navigating relationships and helping us to grow in relationships. And it's not just going to be based on marriage. So, you know, we were single at one time. Believe it or not, my single game wasn't very strong. I'll be honest. So I wasn't doing a great job. <laughs> So we'll learn more from our mistakes than our wins. How about that? But so what we're going to do today, um, if questions begin to emerge or rise up, feel free to text them. They'll be on the screen. Uh, today's message is agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. So I'll do an abbreviated message and then we'll jump into some Q&A. So this is Amos chapter 3, verse 3, and I'll break it down for us in just a moment. But this verse of scripture says this by the minor prophet Amos. You know, the Bible is actually broken up into two major parts, Old Testament and New Testament, before Jesus, after Jesus. And amongst those that break up, there's the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. These are the books of law and God revealing himself to humanity. After that, it kind of variates and goes down different paths from poetry to stories, and some of them are between minor prophets and major prophets. Now, that kind of sucks to be known as a minor prophet. Like, how did they become major and I became minor? But that's a whole other story we'll figure out in heaven. But this is Amos. So he's a little lower, lower on the totem pole. He's got a real quick book, but he is super important for us today because he says this verse of scripture, which has been quoted probably at every wedding you've been, been to. It says this, how can two walk together unless they agree? So what he's saying is, is this, who gets on the bus not knowing where the bus is going? How can we plan the vacation if we don't know the destination? How can two of us or more walk together unless we come to the critical, clear understanding, are we going in the same place? Now, Amos begins to put this verse of scripture down because he's talking about how do we align with God? Like if we don't agree with God's destination, why should we claim to follow him? Such a simple truth, because many people have an association with God, but they're not walking in the same path of God. We see that all the time. Like, yo, I'm a Christian. No, you're not, brother. <laughs> and our goal is not just to have a form of legalism. Our goal is to minimize the gap between what we profess we believe and how we live. And that's what Amos really gets down. So me personally, looking at this verse of scripture, for the last 11 years, I feel like the Lord has been fine-tuning our marriage as a couple, and we see this happening all the time. If you get to know us outside of church, I believe we are the same people outside of church. Thank God, trying to keep it that way. But one of the things is, I think we're even crazier outside of church. So this is me bridled. And believe it or not, my wife is lightweight funnier than me. But don't tell anybody else. Don't tell her I told you. So I steal a lot of her jokes. It's true. I'm just not going to lie about it. She says something. I'm like, yo, that was a whippersnapper. I'm going to take that for the sermon. <laughs> it happens all the time. But one of the things that we've always disagreed upon is the way that we walk. Literally, we get out of the car and I am the type of person, and maybe you agree with this, we get out of the car. I'm like trying to get everything done all at one time. Right. So I got my headphones on and I'm going to the grocery store and I'm like, yo, I'm gonna get a workout in while I'm at the grocery store, while I'm listening to the audio book. And I got to get in and out of there. My wife, on the other hand, she's strolling. 
she's just chilling. It's just a Sunday afternoon. She's looking cute. She didn't put time into makeup. She's like, I'm about to let them know. I, it's just a different way than the way we walk. And so we'll go to the store. And I mean, there's been times where literally I'm like in the store and I will look back and my wife is like, fool, you're not about to rush me. Like that's kind of the mentality. So we've learned over the years of marriage, ministry, kids, family, houses, moves, relocate, all this stuff that to walk together requires of, it requires everything. It requires a cognitive, an emotional, a spiritual fine tuning. And there is an expectation that to walk with someone would be easy or easier. And I'll just say this, what of great value in your life came easy? What of great significance, importance, something that has altered the way that you live and see the world has come easy? You can leave today and you can treat your father to a a Big Mac or you can go to the value meal at McDonald's. I don't recommend that, but it's called the value meal. Well, what value is it adding to you? That little cheese blanket is killing you, actually. The value is found in the convenience and convenience comes cheap. So what I'm saying is, is this, how can two walk together unless they fine tune their souls and come to the agreement that they're going in the same direction? And that requires work. Somehow we've convinced ourselves that in relationships, it's too unnatural to disagree. Now there's a tipping point of disagreement because how many know like you can't just fight all the time. And when you have been married long enough or been in a relationship long enough, you will realize like sometimes the fights just keep coming. How do you get off of that path and walk together in agreement? And I'm telling you, there's been some moments too. I remember one time when we moved out here, God is tricky. He'd be pulling fast ones on us. There was a season in our marriage where we were building our house and remodeling and living in it because I was dumb and I was like, we should save money because how many of you guys know sometimes saving money ain't saving money? Or you saved a few dollars, but your soul took on more mileage than it was supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a pinto soul. You don't got a Honda soul. You got a pinto. Like it's like. <laughs> but I remember in that season, I, there was an expectation. Like, man, this is going to be so far worse. And there was grace. Like we argued less and was on the same page. And then there's other seasons where we're like, man, we've experienced high levels of conflict. And I had to be careful because I started to consider ourselves like a high conflict couple. There's like terminology. How many guys know when you kind of go through a deficit, you start looking for words? Like you got a little mole right here and then you go on med.com you know, and you realize you got tuberculosis of the neck. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what happened to me? And we have to be careful that we don't diagnose or borrow language that isn't helpful for us to actually really get underneath the hood of what's happening in us. And I think we're, we're, we're in an amazing time where language is firing off and people are looking for words. But sometimes I think we diagnose too quickly. And especially when it comes to relationships. Like, is this the relationship I'm supposed to be in? Or we ask ourselves this question, like, is this how it's supposed to feel? Is it supposed to be like this? So there's a couple of key questions that I believe Amos can help us understand and help get dialogue going when it comes to relationships. The first question that's a key question is this. Are we clear on where we're going? And this is more than just romantic. This is a platonic relationship. Time changes. You've changed time zones. You were homies. You was running the streets together, having a great time. Distance, family, dynamics have changed. You guys are going in different directions. Is this still a priority? Is this relationship still valuable enough that it requires the time and attention? You have to answer that. But you can answer that if you're clear on are we going in the same destination? The second key question I think we can ask is this. Where, when are we going to get there? Sometimes you can be clear like, man, we're going to get married. We're going to have 2.5 kids and a dog and a fence. Or, hey, man, I'm going to live my best life. I'm moving to New York. I'm going to be out there living my best life. But how fast are you going to get there? And the last question is this. How will you get there? What are your strides? What's your cadence? What tools are you going to use? Are you literally saying, hey, man, I'm going to, you know, Keep my head down, finish out this career, get enough capital, retire when I'm 22. I don't know what your game plans are, but that's awesome if you got there like that. Just remember to tithe on that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I say. Just give it to the Lord. We'll figure out what to do with it. But the big idea is this. Walking with God and someone else requires agreement and alignment. We have to be willing to agree that we are going to disagree. But let it not be because 
of consistency and clarity. Let that disagreement not rise up because we were bad stewards of the relationship. Because we didn't check in and say like, hey, how are you doing? Like, I know we got kids and we got an enterprise and we're doing this, but how are you doing? Or on the other side of that spectrum of, hey, I know we said we're best friends, but I've never positioned myself to call you or check on you. I don't even know what's going on in your spiritual health, let alone your mental health. Hey, I keep saying I'm going to be a family person, but my family has no idea what's going on in my life. How can two walk together unless they agree? And so what Amos is trying to get us to understand is is this. For us to walk together, it requires agreement and alignment. And what I've learned is consistency and clarity are the two biggest gifts that we can give somebody. See, what Amos is experiencing right now, he's in a, a real strategic vantage point because Amos, he's probably not the most educated. He's probably not the most rich and famous person. He's actually a shepherd and a fig farmer. I don't know what figs was doing back in the day. I don't know the stock market on figs. Apple is doing all right, but figs could be doing a whole different thing. But um, bum. So anyway, no one got it. Moving on. But one of the things that is interesting about Amos is this, is that he is about 10 miles outside of Jerusalem and about six miles to Bethlehem. So he's like right in the middle. The beautiful thing about this is I think this is not only prophetic what he's saying, but he's prophetic in his position. Because this is probably the same path that the angels came when they went to foretell the shepherds about Jesus. And what's interesting about Amos is this, he gets to see everyone that's coming in and out of the city. He gets to see when people are dragging their kids into Jerusalem to make their sacrifices, grudgingly not wanting to do it. He's seen when somebody got robbed outside and no one went to check on him. And Amos was probably the one that investigated to make sure this man was all right. Amos is not caught up in the chaos and the rhythm of the city. He's out in the country and he gets to see objectively what's going on in the people. And what Amos comes to this conclusion is, is this, is that these people claim to know God, but their hearts are far from him. And what Amos does for the first really four or five chapters is try to convince this nation and the surrounding nations that they've had idols and other worshipers. And they've literally said they love God, but their hearts are far from them. And Amos's number one objective is this, to show us that there is no gap between our worship and our ethics. Because our worship should impact our ethics and our ethics impact our relationships. So let me break it down for you. It's like this. If I say, man, I love God and I know his word. And Jesus says to love the Lord with all your God, heart, mind, soul and strength and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is the two greatest commandments. All the law hinges upon this. Well, many of us be like, I love God, but I hate you. There's incongruency. Your worship and your ethics. There's a significant gap. So I'll give you an example. This is how I experienced it the other day. My wife is driving and we have a fairly nice car. Not that that means anything, but we're driving. And in my arrogance, this is what I said. We're driving. And I said, babe, don't go down their street. They down there. I said that. Now you're like, who is they? (laughs) Don't worry about it. We all got a they. (laughs) You all got a they. There's the people like, ooh, avoid them. And as soon as I said that, The Holy Spirit was like, oh, Negro, you think you better than somebody? (laughs) I was convicted. Why? Because on Sunday I can be like this, but on Monday I can live in avoidance of a whole group of people? Now, let me just be honest with you. There's some streets you shouldn't go down. (laughs) Not because you love God, but because they're going to get you. (laughs) I don't know why I went in full slave mode right there. I'm like, they coming for us. All the light-skinned people got nervous right there. They were like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. The point that I'm making is, is this. All of us are capable of disassociating our spiritual identity with our relational identity. So we can live as Christians when it's comfortable. But we move ourselves out of that bubble and it becomes difficult. Because anything of value requires work. A whole group of people. Now, for me, it's just this. It was just like, ah, I I could, you know, I could make it sound better. But at the end of it, my heart is broken. Because I'm like, man, I see the degradation. I see the brokenness. I see the abuse. And But to avoid it means that there's something going on in me. Because sometimes we avoid dealing with the disagreement or the things that we experience because we feel like we're not able to change it. 
And we do it on a social level. We do it on a relational level. That's why people can live in an abusive relationship for far longer than God wanted them to because there's this disassociation. You see, the reason why Amos' words are so important to us is because more than just getting a biblical construct for relationships, these are reasons why we should care. But number one is because you're about to lose friends. You want to know why? Because every presidential election, people lose friends. It don't make a difference. Uncle Biden, Uncle Joe, Trump, they coming for you. Well, you don't get one of them. And at that moment, expect some disagreement. Does our worship align with our ethics? Or do our ethics align with our worship? And our ethics will dictate how we treat one another. You cannot separate them. And so one of the things that we'll see from Amos' words is this. We may be misinterpreting what we view as right versus God's version. You see, Amos writes in chapter 3, verse 10, he says, My people have forgotten how to do right, says the Lord. He says, because they've become so filled with pride and their wealth, they think that they're immune to God, that God is co-signing on their sin because they've experienced monetary blessing. Monetary blessing is not an indicator of God's blessing. Sometimes you could be blessed just for being a good steward and be a full-on atheist in your heart. God also allows stewardship and principles to guide and line the ways of our world. Now, here's the thing. I think you can have both. I think God can call you to be in a line in your heart and also experience fruitfulness and finances. And what Amos is saying is, is this. Are you aligned with God because you claim to follow him, but you don't treat the poor well? He says, you claim to follow God, but there is injustice in all of your government. And he says, it's not just for the Israelites, it's all the nations. There was one verse of scripture that I love, and I was thinking about it earlier. It says, is Ethiopia not more important than Israel? It says that, and it's a rhetorical question, because what he's saying is, is this, God cares for all nations. And what he did with Israel, he's done with other nations that brought freedom. And in that one verse of scripture, a whole theology of, of race and diversity and how God sees humanity as this spectrum. And he can calls and invites all of us to experience alignment with him. So the question that we ask this morning is how to, how to agree when you disagree. So I'm going to try to do a couple of points and then I'm going to invite my wife up in just about five minutes. So the first thing is this. Can we agree on the destination? You will never experience a fruit relationship unless you first agree on the destination. Amos says, how can two walk together unless they agree? And one of the things that we see is, is this, or I'll say this. Do not roll the dice on your future. Make decisions that align with your destination. What I'm saying is, is this. Many times people show up to the universe like an uncle at a picnic with a handful of sunflower seeds. And they literally, by a roll of the dice, ah, what am I going to get? Well, this person showed up in my life. Ah, this could be a good relationship. Snake eyes. Ah, got me again. Why are you playing craps with your calling? Sometimes we make decisions that are so counterintuitive with where we are going. We're like, man, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start businesses, 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 businesses. <laughs> Moving to Miami and swimming with the dolphins ain't going to make you a lucrative business, my friend. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is this. If you have a vision or a preferred destination of where God is leading you and calling you, are you continually to align in relationships that are counterintuitive to where you are going? Yes. That disassociation. And let alone, many times we get caught up in frustration because there is a subjectivity versus an objectivity in relationships. We become super subjective about relationships. How many of you guys ever watch these like new relationship like uh, documentaries? Or uh, what's this one gal? She's like a relationship guru, but she goes find a person for you. What is it called? What is it called? Love on the Spectrum. We've been watching all of these things too. No, it's an a Indian gal. She finds, what's her name? What is it? Indian matchmaker. Man, I've got a strong head nod right there. I don't know if y'all want this. Y'all want to run this play again where like somebody else picks for you? Oh, y'all not feeling that. See, look at that. Look, that's how they got things done. They'll be like, your family, this family, we make this happen. 
there's a lot of subjectivity now. And what I mean by this is that we have now become such a preference-based culture. It's all about our preference. So people be like, man, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, I want this, I got that. They got to have that. She got to have that. If you don't got that, they ain't got that. We, I mean, like, it's all preference. And what happens is, is this. You get these two different people who have completely opposite preferences, and they never move forward in their life. Yes. Why? Because they're at odds with something that is so subjective. To be objective-oriented is this. You got preferences, I got preferences, but where are we going? Are we both going in the same direction? It becomes like this. And I love how God will always put people together that are different than us. Friendships, romance, all of the above, even our kids. God always has this sense of like putting people together because there's two different types of people. There are people that are like, enjoy the journey. And they're in their feelings. Just enjoy the journey. Life's a journey. Enjoy it. It's a journey. Enjoy it. Then there's the other group of people. Like, winning isn't everything. Winning is the only thing. Every day, I just win, 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 win. They get in my way, I'm winning. Boom, get out my way. I got to win. And you put those two people together. Enjoy the journey. We winning. There's going to be conflict in that. How are we going to win? Can you define what a win is? You see people in their feelings. I'm like, no, it's a journey. And then other people are like, what do, do, did you see the data? Did you see? What is it? Like that, that relational spectrum. And what happens is, is this, to move beyond preference and personality, we have to be very clear, where are we going? And I would say this is why I see most relationships fall short or short circuit. is because people don't spend enough time bringing brutal, clear, honest discussion around their relationship. Hey, when do we want to have kids? Hey, what does sex look like after kids? How does that work? Hey, we can still go into the club? What does vacations look like? Now that you took that new job and that new job is already eating up all of our time. Hey, how do we still be friends even though I live halfway around the country? What I'm saying is, is this. If we want to have this sense of openness and honesty, and we're not modeling that in a healthy way, we will always live in a sense of frustration and disagreement, and we won't be able to walk together. That's why canceling is so beneficial for our current mindset. It's because all I have to do is avoid and ignore, but never deal with why you're different than me. And as long as my social media feed cosigns on my insanity, I'm good. Be careful. Because how can two walk together unless they agree? And on that note, I'm going to invite my wonderful wife, who's going to help me walk together. We're going to answer some Q&A. Do you need a chair? Give her a hug. Okay. You did a great job. All right, that's good. Thank you so much. Do we need to give him any disclaimers? I am me. <laughs> we realize, like... Us coming together and answering these questions will either make you feel like, oh, this was so refreshing, or I'm never coming back to this church. So (laughs) (laughs) it could 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 totally throw us off the loop. So we're going to do our best. Just a little bit of a disclaimer. We're not going to be able to answer all the questions. Uh, We're talking as a team how we can answer some of the questions offline. Okay. All right. We got got some ones already. Okay. I'm going to see if I can read it. That was a lot of questions. Y'all hit us with some questions. What does it mean to... Okay. All right. I have so many. (laughs) Man, my left to right is not their left to right. Okay. We're going to start with this one. All right. If our moral standards come from God, why do you think we disagree on sexual morality in our society? Now, you want me to answer this one? Or you got it? Well, okay. Number one. When, especially when it comes to sexual morality, like, there's a lot of nuance to this. But let's just be very honest. The Bible is pretty clear on when it comes to sex. Sex outside of marriage. Husband and wife. That's what the Bible says is sexual morality. Now, one of the things when it comes to sexuality is this. One, I'm not going to let people prop me up to make you believe or not believe. We go back to what Jesus has told us. (laughs) That very simple. But what we do is, is this. A lot of times, people, humanity, I'll just throw myself under the bus. Following God, I knew that there was a line that would cross that line. 
And what I love to do before I got married, I like to live as close to that line as possible. I wanted to do as much grimy and dirty stuff without having to tell my pastor about it. And what I'm saying is, is this. There's a line of sexual morality that no human, no human can call us to other than God. And so what we see is, is this, is that people are wrestling with the desires of their heart and they want someone or something to reconcile those desires that are in their heart. And here, I cannot reconcile the desires in your heart and what God calls us to. God has to reconcile that. I can be so honest and just say like, hey, man, I had things happen to me that a child experienced that no child should experience. And that tweaked and warped mindsets and viewpoints. And even getting married, it wasn't like, oh man, it radically changed. But there was a process of undergoing a walking with the Holy Spirit and allowing God to renew my mind and saying, Lord, call me into what is true, not just to what I feel. Because we can be in your feelings and your feelings can get somebody pregnant. I don't have a lot to add other than there's a huge difference between the standards of God and the standards of culture. And the standards of culture would make you be confused about sexual morality. Um, but the standards of God are very clear. If you're in the word and you hear from him and you actually ask him with an open heart and an open hand, God, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Sometimes I've done it a lot of times. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. And then I walk away because I don't really want to hear it. But I said it. Um, so that makes me feel better about myself. But I didn't really want to hear what you had to say. Um, but the standards of God and the standards of culture are completely different. And when someone tries to make you feel like they're the same, they are acting in the flesh. And the flesh is crazy. Please don't diminish the flesh. The flesh is crazy. Yeah. Second question, how do you navigate conversations around gender, sex, identity within the context of Christianity in a Jesus-led life? Um, constantly. So when, especially when it comes, like we live in a day and age where like gender fluidity, um, and I will say this, I am a middleman probably on most things. There's some things I'm like, that's black and white. You just can't get away with that. That's just what it is. But I also can see nuance. So I will say this. One, when it comes to navigating gender and sex, it's a man and a woman. I didn't write the book on that. <laughs> now, there's ways that we want to express that. And there's ways that we want to have conversations about that. And you can jump into the DMs, but I didn't write the book on that. Now, here's the caveat I will say to this. I believe God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit express the full spectrum of gender and masculinity and femininity. And what I mean by that is, is this. We have God the Father, the God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there are femininity parts of God and both masculine parts of God. Does that make sense? For instance, like even the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes... And I would say is a fuller exp expression and spectrum of who God is. So, for instance, there's like mystery to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit doesn't show up and just be like, hey, I'm the Holy Spirit. You better listen to God. There's a sensitivity. There is a posture. There is a patience. There's something else that is in the Godhead that fully expresses. And we see nuance into that. So. I don't know if that answers the question as clear as possible. But when it comes to gender, I mean, there's a man and a woman now. The constructs of that, that's what's being more debated, which is unique. It's like, what does it mean to be a man and what does that mean to be a woman? Is that just genitalia? And what I'm saying is, is this, genitalia plays a huge part. But I'm more concerned about the mindset of men and the mindset of women than anything else. And what I mean by that is, is this, we're starting to see some vacancies in our culture and our society that should cause all of us to be alarmed. We're starting to see like, and I'll just even say this and be very clear, like even especially like in the black community, man, we've already been in a deficit of fathers and, and husbands. And now we want to create more ambiguity, amb ambiguity around those things. I think we have to be very careful because not only we've seen the spiritual ramifications of those vacant spaces that God ordained for a father and for a mother, but I think we're going to see even more of that if we're not careful to realize there are spiritual places and position, and gender does affect the way that we lead and relate to one another. And by no means, I'll just say this, if there's people in your life or even come to this church, by no means would you ever be ridiculed or abused or chastised. But I want you to know, like, God's heart for all of us is to have our sexuality 
and our morality restored in such a way that we can honor and reflect him. So I spent a lot of time on that one. Let's go to the next one. Oh, I was saying, thank you. I didn't mean to turn my back on y'all like that. I was this guy. just trying to get through so we get some time in there. Uh, what does it mean to be content as a single person? I don't know. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> That's terrible. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think it means finding gratitude in the season that you're in. It means being able to look at every aspect of your life and being grateful to the Lord for where you are, knowing that he's going to take you somewhere else, but being grateful for where you are. It's finding joy in the things that you're in and not walking around life just a sucky person because you happen to be single. Um, you love where you are and you know that God is going to call you somewhere else, but you love where you are and you capitalize on where you are. Don't just walk through life letting things happen to you, but you're a great person. This is the greatest time of your life and you're going to let God be God in your life because you're single. And then you'll let God be God in your life when you're married. And some people may not be married. Right. Now we forget there's some scriptures in there that say you not get married. It's not going to happen for you. And that's the thing. There's some people that may live that life. I used to think that for me. No, (laughs) I was very wrong. That's not for me. But what I will also say is this is a single person in our church. That's one of the things I'll just be honest with you as pastors, because we've been married for quite some time. Like we realize that most of the church is, is of single people. That's awesome. Praise God for you. And never do we want to diminish that season of singleness and never do we want to like, what's the word? We don't want to diminish marriage as well. But I will say this. There are a lot of people. Our culture is radically changing. And unfortunately, you guys are the guinea pigs. People are getting married much later in life. People are getting married closer to their 40s. People are getting married closer and having kids at 45. Like everyone in our neighborhood right now is like 50 with no kids. That's our neighborhood. They got two dogs, though. They got them two dogs. They love them dogs, but they didn't want no kids. So all that to say is that, one, in your season of singleness, you cannot compare your life to someone else's. And wish a shoulda, coulda, woulda is the worst mentality to have in that season of singleness. Um, it's either preparation or it's just building. Like, and that's not going to change whether you get married. It's just you get to build with somebody else. And that adds a whole different dynamic to it as well. How do you advise friends in unhealthy relationships? Get out. Don't Moving be- on. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> just don't be. If it's toxic, they know. They already know. They know. They know. I just had a conversation the other day and I was like, you know and I know y'all should not be together. And I will say this, as a pastor, out of all the 20-something years of ministry, I've only told maybe two, two people not to be married. And there was one couple, I was like, do not marry that fool. She was like, I love him. I was like, do not marry him. He cheated on her. So <laughs> they didn't get married though. Sorry. So that's all I'm saying. Moving on before I get myself in trouble. <laughs> How do your parenting styles differ and what do you do to present a unified response for your kids? That's a very great conversation. Pastor Lonnie. Holy moly. <laughs> Get him. I feel like Red Man and Method Man on how high. Get him. Get him. Well, we don't often differ, so that's good. That's- high five for us. But um, when we do, I think it's important that the kids never know that we differ. Um, and that if we do, if we find that we have, we will have a conversation later on why we differ, why his opinion or my opinion is, is different. Um, and then we go to the kids as a united front. Um, we never want them to know that we don't have it together, really is what it is. Um, but, but they know. But they know. They do know. <laughs> they we try really hard, but they know. Vivi just told us the other day, I know y'all be fighting. <laughs> Dead serious, real talk. So we're sitting out, we're having dinner, trying to be good parents, because you know pastor's kids be trifling. So we're like, we're changing the game. So we're talking, and Vivi be like, I know when y'all fighting. Y'all go and y'all don't want to talk. Y'all don't want to talk to us. Y'all just want to be left alone when y'all fighting. And then she said, y'all was fighting today. I said, actually, you're wrong. We had a great day. We loved each other. Dead serious. So they go, no, I mean, like, you can't hide it, but keep going. Yes, they will know. But I think for us, it's important that at the end of the day, that we don't want her, one of the children to go to him and get what she wants and the other one to come to me. they do that too. They do that too. It's really snacks, but they, um, yes. Yeah, I mean, so I will say this, uh, the 
parenting, so different styles for sure, but again, the same destination. Um, like we've agreed like, hey, we want to raise our kids in the ways of the Lord, want them to grow up. And we've learned so much because our kids are so different. Like, I mean, being honest, kids is probably the only area, if not, I wouldn't say the only area, the most significant area where I've been the most fearful. Like I've just been like, whoo. And Lonnie's been super strong, like much stronger. I thought I'd be like, yeah, let him experience life. I'm like, forget this. We move into Texas. <laughs> The world is trifling right now. And um, so we've had to have a lot of conversations and discussion of like, okay, how we're going to reinforce this. And also we've invited our kids into conversations. Like the biggest thing that we're trying to do is create healthy relationship that our kids not only like to be with us, because you can't be their friends. Like to some point, like when y'all 19, we'd be friends. Right now, we just your daddy. Um, but we want to like each other. And we want to be able to have trust mutually. Um, because we're not going to be able to watch them out all the time. At some point, they're going to have to be on their own. And unfortunately, that happens a lot sooner. But I may dip on y'all and move to Florida. How do you know when God wants you to fight for a relationship or move on? Uh, you want me to start that? Sure. Okay, so there's a spectrum of this. So one, you know, there's friendship, uh, dating relationship, and marriage. And all of those relationships require different responses. Some of them are similar. But when you're like a friendship and you're just like, man, we keep coming. They keep talking about me. I talk about them to retaliate of them talking about me in this drama. And I don't know what you got going on. But when people show you who you are, who they are, believe them. Like, and that doesn't mean you need to cancel them. But also getting clarity on who that person is will reinforce how much space they're going to have into your life. Like every relationship, like there's a criteria of relationships that I have. It just really is. And that criteria is not a bad relationship. It's like some people, man, we do a ministry. We live in life together. There's some people like, hey, I'm here to show up for you. I'm just here to minister to you. We may not ever go out. Not because I don't like you. Life just may not give us the chance to be able to do that. So having that kind of understanding of how much relational space that people are going to have in my life helps me to be able to navigate. So with that being said, when it comes to a friendship and it's extremely toxic and it's been toxic for 20 something years, are you going to change? Are they going to change? How are you going to work together? When you're in a dating relationship and you're like, you know what, how we keep fighting? Y'all have been dating for 25 years. What are we doing? You doing it? Just do it. Do it. Do it. And do it. Do it. <laughs> but where's that conflict coming from? Is it a preference? Is it personal? And many times people continue to fight it's because they're not verbalizing what their needs really are. Like that was one of the first thing that we got in counseling, first year of marriage. And we went to counseling because of somebody else's problems. And we were like, we gotta go to counseling. But I remember a counselor, he messed me up because he was like, Jules, how many needs that you have? I was like, food, sex, and tell me you love me every once in a while. Those are my three needs. 36 needs later. <laughs> I thought she gonna have 40, 50 needs. I'm going to have two needs. She had 38. I had 36. We've always had to communicate that because when someone steps on your needs, it's like stepping on your oxygen tank. So that's how you may be fighting the wrong thing. You're fighting the person, but it's really your inability to communicate what you need from that person so they can walk with you. Marriage, do everything that you possibly can to work hard, not only in the marriage, but on the marriage. And that's what I would say to that. How do you increase connection in your marriage with children? You do that one. You're good at that. I wasn't, though. Okay, I'll do that one. I then. am now. I can do it. I didn't start off well. I think it's important to remember that the marriage comes first. As hard as it is to say out loud, the marriage has to come first. Once the kids start coming first, you have no marriage. So the marriage has to come first. And that means there needs to be boundaries for the kids. If the kids go to bed and now we, this is our time to talk. This is our time to eat a little pudding, some ice cream. Pudding? <laughs> what? what you be doing when I go to bed? <laughs> pudding is good. <laughs> pudding? <laughs> go ahead. Um. <laughs> Lord, redeem my mind. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, man. But the marriage has to come first. The kids have to come second. Um, and I think as you two unite on that, the kids will understand. It will not feel like the kids are coming last. It will just feel like the kids are coming 
Second. Can I just say this? I'll just be real quick. Seasons are important for marriage. So there's things. Um, I'm, yeah, I got the thumbs up. So I'm going to just say this. There was a season in our marriage we had to plan everything. Everything. I want that to be a small season, though. I won't be planning everything. We could plan the cookout. But what we realized was this. If we're not intentional with that time, somebody else is going to take that time from us. And I'm the worst person because I will be distracted by all the needs of the church and ministry and all of those things. So I will say this is that when seasons happen and you have to be brutally intentional, don't get angry at yourself for that type of intentionality. It's better to be intentional than just to leave it to chance. But I think when, especially when it comes to like sexual intimacy, that requires a level of intentionality that both of you guys need to talk about that. Also, I think Lonnie initiated a couple of things that have been really profound. One is we have a marriage meeting. And again, I hate meetings. I'm like, most of my life is meetings. The first three years of our marriage, having a marriage meeting, I was like, I do not want to be here. I do not want to do this. This is dumb. Now I look forward to it. But we had to work out a dynamic because there's so much that's happening and moving so fast. We had to create times where we can talk. And what we've done, learned is, is this, when we know we have a consistent moment to have conversations, then it eliminates any ambiguity or any unnecessary frustration that remains in the heart. I'm going to just tell you something, fellas, what I've learned. She frustrated. Something you did five years ago. And you don't even know what you did, but it still hurts. Have you ever created an opportunity to talk about that? He's trying. I promise you. He's trying. It may not seem like it, but he's trying with all of his heart. And he just needs that sense of affirmation that you're recognizing what he's putting out there. But if you never create a moment to have that conversation, both of you will end up being frustrated. Man, that was some, somebody should have said amen, huh? <laughs> Byron, you getting up and walking out on that one? <laughs> All right, last question. Last question. How do you discern whether someone is good and, and checks all the boxes but isn't God's best for you? First of all, have boxes to check. You can't just be out there willy-nilly dating and you don't got no parameters, you don't got no red flags, you don't have nothing for, for a box to check. So know what, your, know what your red flags are. Know what it is that you don't want to do, what you do want to do. Where do you want to go in life? Um, and do they align? That's a box to check. But don't, don't compromise when you realize they don't want to go the same place that you go and then you think maybe in 15 years you'll change their mind. Um, if, if you have boxes, I think that's the first step is to have boxes and give those, submit those boxes to the Lord and know what you're willing to budge on and what you're not willing to budge on. But um, first of all, have boxes to check in the beginning. Yeah, and then I would just say pastors, parents, and peers. Not that pastors should be number one. But I, I just seen there's a lot of health. Like, let me just tell you, I, don't, I can't speak for every pastor. We can't speak for every pastor. But we can tell you how we pastor. We legitimately love you guys. Like, and some of you, we don't have a, we don't know each other that very well. But if you know us, like, we don't win when you lose, right? Like when we see God's best in your life, that's like fills up our tank. So there's been times where I've told people like, hey man, you know, this is my encouragement to you. Or man, I think that's a great person or vice versa. So all that to say is the principle I wanted to reiterate is this, be around healthy relationships that they can help you identify what a healthy relationship is. Like, if you're friends, like, that's the thing. Like, if you can, if you're scared to bring them to church, why? Like, you can't bring them to church? You scared to bring them to your friends? You don't want your daddy to lay eyes on them? Your mom to lay eyes on them? There's something else going on in that relationship, and that's just indicators that you either are afraid of something or something may be broken in that relationship. So that's all we got. Good job. Is that helpful? I feel like we did some good work. I see a dad stretching. He ready to go eat the brisket. Let me pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for this great Father's Day. Uh, bless our church. Help us to continue to grow, Lord, and create um, conversations of honesty and, Lord, long-suffering with each other. Teach us to love you more importantly. And, Lord, we put our preference, Lord, to the side and ask you to give us godly perspectives. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.